Welcome, welcome everybody to this exciting, exciting talk that we're going to have today. We are so very excited uh, here at Cyber Warrior for this event that they're hosting. Um, we're just so thrilled to have none other than Director Jen Easterly um, of of the uh, of CISA to come and share with us a little bit today. Jen is uh, a, a phenomenal, phenomenal career. I won't bore you all with the details, even though I wasn't bored. I know you guys would be wild as I was. I'm talking about a Rhodes Scholar. I'm talking about someone who served our nation bravely for over 20 years, are being distinguished with by earning two bronze stars, setting up the nation's first cyber battalion in the army and the list goes on and on and on sir uh, working in the nsa and currently serving as only the third director of cisa um director director easterly is she's she is a warrior's warrior not just on the battlefield but in cyberspace so i don't want to i don't want to take up any more of her time um everybody just give some some emojis and some hands up and some hand claps as as i introduce to some and present to others none other than director jen easterly director easterly Awesome. Well, thank you for that very, very, very kind uh, introduction, Elliot. We really appreciate it. And I'm so glad to be here. Uh, Cyber Warrior has been a fantastic partner for us. And I'm most excited about the panel that's going to uh, follow us because I know we've got some great folks who can talk about making the transition from the military into the cyber profession. You know, I'll talk a little bit about my path, Elliot. And then if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But, you know, I've I've had a pretty fulsome career at this point in time, more than 30 years, and I've gotten to do things within the intelligence community, things within the White House, things within the private sector. But, you know, I really think of myself first and foremost as a soldier. Started off, joined West Point just, uh, just after my 18th birthday. And then, as you said, spent about 21 years in the military. First part of that was in the tactical army in the 25th Infantry Division, and then at Fort Bragg as part of 18th Corps, and then spent the last half of my career at the National Security Agency at Fort Meade. But um, my identity is very much wrapped into being a soldier, being a veteran. And I'm very proud to say that CISA is actually 40% veterans. And so I want to wish everybody out there um, a very happy Veterans Day. Um, it's incredible to know that we have people who have been very willing to serve their country, continue to serve our country, uh, whether it's in uniform, out of uniform, or continuing in federal service. So it's really humbling to me. And you know, one of the reasons that I think veterans can be so successful in the field of cybersecurity is that with respect to cyber defense in particular, you cannot be effective in this field unless you are a collaborative person, unless you are a team player, unless you are a servant leader. And frankly, since I came to CISA, that has only been magnified as we look to connect between the federal government and industry and our state and local partners and our international partners to be able to share information in real time so we can understand that threat environment and then drive down risk to the nation. And having that ethos where you want to collaborate, you want to be a team player, you know how to lead effectively, uh, but also you are entrepreneurial you are intellectually curious. You are uh, willing to learn new skills and, and you're a continuous learner. These are all things that I think the military does a great job of inculcating into every service member. And again, I think it lends itself really, really well to a career in cyber. You know, I really got into cyber when I was in the U.S. Army. Uh, stood up the Army's first cyber battalion known as the Army Network Warfare Battalion. In fact, our tagline, and I've got a poster sitting, uh, hanging on the wall behind me saying, uh, are you ready to be a cyber warrior? So it works very well with the uh, with the theme today. 
Uh, but that was where I began. And then I helped to stand up U.S. Cyber Command. And that was a fantastic, again, lesson in the power of teamwork, working with Colonel Paul Nakasone at that time, Captain T.J. White, Colonel S.L. Davis, and uh, now all three our general officers, either active duty or retired. And, you know, it really is all about teamwork. It's all about collaboration. And those are the skills that are going to make veterans um, particularly successful in the field of cyber as you look to transition out of the military and look to take a job, whether it's in a place like CISA or whether it's in a place in the private sector. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. I wish everybody a very happy Veterans Day. And Elliot, I'm happy to stay on if there's any questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was That is absolutely so impressive. And you said so much that resonates with me. And I, wa I want to take you back just a little bit to some of the things that you've done over your over the course of your career. And I want to take you back about 10 years. And there was an executive order that was signed by President, then President Barack Obama, Executive Order 13636. You may be very familiar with that one. That was the that was the executive order that led to the creation of what we know now as the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, my question for you, Director Easterly, is President Biden just um, uh, issued an executive order targeted towards AI and safe and secure AI. Do you what what are some of the outcomes that you do you that you expect to for that executive order to lead to? Yeah, it's a great question. And hopefully folks did see uh, the launch of that executive order, as you mentioned, uh, on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. It's incredibly important. That is one of the most comprehensive and ambitious executive orders that I have ever seen. And that's saying something since I spent a lot of time in government and about five plus years in the White House. But it's a really important one in how it is looking to manage the risk of these very, very powerful, very fast moving, and arguably very unpredictable capabilities. You know, AI will do tremendous things for us. It'll make our lives easier. It'll make our lives better. But it will do the same thing for our adversaries, whether that's criminals or terrorists or rogue nations. And so we have to come together with like-minded partners, with industry to ensure that we have the right capabilities to be able to manage the risk that is implicated by artificial intelligence. Where CISA comes in there is we operate at the nexus of artificial intelligence, cyber defense, and critical infrastructure. So coming out of that, we're already working on our implementation of three key lines of effort. One is to enable us to optimally leverage generative artificial intelligence capabilities for cyber defense, using some of these capabilities to detect uh, adversary activity so that we can proactively defend against it. So that's one big line of effort. Two uh, is to assure artificial intelligence systems to make sure that they are protected from being exploited by threat actors. And we're working very closely with our NIST colleagues. You mentioned NIST. They're looking at the full range of red teaming for things like bias, discrimination, security, and we're, we're specifically focused on cybersecurity from a red teaming perspective. And then finally, we're looking at how AI capabilities can bring risks to the full range of critical infrastructure. And so we're, we're gonna work with what's called our sector risk management agencies as we identify places where uh, critical infrastructure could be subject to threats from AI, and then we're working on guidelines to mitigate risks. So that's what we're focused on, but it truly is a whole of government effort and really a whole of society effort. So I'm excited about uh, our way forward. We're gonna be publishing our external roadmap next week, and we're already working with international partners on guidelines for uh, development uh, development of cyber secure AI capabilities. So a lot of a lot of great work to come on that, Elliot. 
I'm excited to see what comes of that. And we have a couple of questions that's coming in for, for, for from people right now, but I want to just ask a, a quick follow up and then I'll get to the questions that are that are coming in right now. Um, one of the outcomes that is measurable from the NIST cybersecurity framework, we used to track this thing called dwell time. And we still do, but the, for, for, for those who aren't aware, the dwell time is the time that a threat actor compromises your system and they remain on your, on your systems undetected for X number of days. And 2013, in 2013, that dwell time was 280 days. Today, in 2023, that dwell time is down to 13 days. Now, I would like to think that that is an outgrowth of an in in, in impact of the cybersecurity framework with those five functional areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And if that is the case, what measurable outcome could we hope to achieve from, from this AI, safe, secure, and trustworthy AI in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so I, I think the risk management framework has been very helpful in setting out that high level, um, high level guidance to businesses large and small of what they need to do across those five areas. Um, as we know, it is not, it is a voluntary framework. And so really what I think has also made a big difference is the fact that business leaders realize that they need to invest more and more in their people in their capabilities and their technology to drive down, down that risk because it's become um, a seriously reputational issue. And so it's a good framework to have, but also leadership involvement, increasing uh, focus and skills. And so I think it's a myriad of things. But yeah, as, as far as the risk management framework, um, uh, NIST actually put out a whole separate AI risk management framework earlier this year. And we're working on a specific profile that is focused on cyber defense. And so, again, it's all a, a team effort when it comes to driving down risk to the nation. And these frameworks, um, while voluntary, play a really important role in setting the goals and objectives for how to mitigate risk. Excellent. Excellent. Then the questions are coming in now hot and heavy. So this is one that is um, is really germane to the reason why we're here. There are an estimated 200,000 veterans per year that are leaving the service and entering into civilian life into this workforce. So two part question, why cyber? Why cyber? And the second part of that, why is diversity, including veterans, so important to cybersecurity, um, the success of cybersecurity in the nation? Yeah. So in terms of why cyber, um, you know, my personal view is it's an incredibly exciting field to be in. The thing that I love about cybersecurity, separate from just, you know, maybe being a programmer or being a technologist or building networks, is that in cybersecurity, it's a very intellectually demanding job because you are constantly facing off against an adversary. You're constantly trying to protect your system from the myriad of threat actors, whether that's a nation state adversary or a cyber criminal, and you have to really play chess. You have to think ahead about all of the things that you have to do proactively to defend your system. And in many ways, as a veteran, particularly as a former Intel officer, that's what you're doing. You're constantly trying to think about how I can be effective against a living, breathing adversary. So I like that aspect of it. Um, it's also incredibly important. It's relevant to everything because everything, all the services we rely upon, everything that we do every day now is driven by technology. Um, so it is really critical to ensuring the integrity, the availability, the confidentiality of all of our data and the importance of continuity of operations on all of the critical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. So it's a, it's an amazing opportunity to make a real 
impact and to do it in a way that really requires us to very much um, think ahead intellectually to deal with the myriad of threats that are out there. So great, um, fantastic opportunity. And then on diversity, for me, you know, diversity is one of our core principles at CISA. And for anybody who may be interested in joining CISA, I would recommend you go to cisa.gov forward slash culture. Because as you look to transition out of the military and you want to find the right job for you, um, it is, I, I always tell people, look for two things. First of all, look at the culture of the organization you're joining, and then who are you going to work for? Because that often matters as well, because you want to work for somebody that wants to develop your career that is going to be either a good mentor or a good sponsor or a good coach. Those three things tend to be different. But you need somebody who's going to help you make your way in that uh, in that organization, whatever you choose. And frankly, I think diversity is a critical part of the successful culture of any organization. And it's not diversity for diversity's sake. Diversity, creating a diverse environment is the right thing to do. But it's also, very importantly, the smart thing to do because we know the full range of diversity, whether that's neurodiversity, diversity of gender identity, of sexual orientation, of race, of national origin, of background, of skill, uh, of being a veteran, of education level, all of that together equals diversity of thought. You want to have different ways of looking at a problem to be able to solve that problem as effectively as possible. And so that diversity of thought is key to being successful in a field that is highly demanding, highly challenging, and highly dynamic. Uh, Director Easley, you've been so very generous with your time. If, if I could just trouble you for one more question, one more question, and then we we're so very grateful to have you. Um, most veterans, such as myself, um, enter the workforce following a very non-traditional pathway. Mm -hmm. um, some of some of us um, went into the service maybe right out of high school. We didn't go. We didn't go to college right away. And some of us didn't go to college at all. This guy. Mm -hmm. And so, so what is your advice to your hiring managers when you're when you're trying to assess the qualifications of a a a hire? veteran or otherwise, that may have traveled a non-traditional road to get to CISA's door? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. We received new authorities at the end of 2021 called the Cyber Talent Management System, which is not at all focused on degrees. You don't need a degree to get hired through the Cyber Talent Management System. You need to have, I think I would characterize them very broadly, and this is my guidance to my hiring managers. We want people who have aptitude, right? An aptitude to solve really hard problems. And that's about intellectual curiosity and that mindset that you want to go after tough problems to the nation. So it's the aptitude to be able to solve problems and the curiosity to look out there and figure out different ways to solve them. And then very importantly, it might be even more important is attitude. And that's if you're a good cultural fit for the organization. Are you a team player? Are you collaborative? Um, are you an owner? Do you have an ownership mentality? Are you willing to take accountability? Um, all of those things are really, really important to being part of a team organization. Um, and frankly, I also look for people who are genetically wired to be helpful and who are kind people. You know, this is the kind of organization, this is the kind of um, profession where you have to be able to work together to solve problems. And so it's aptitude and it's attitude. And you don't need a college degree. Um, it helps to have some certifications if you don't have a degree, but really it's about your ability to be part of the team effectively and your ability to take on tough problems and to be able to solve them. And I don't know any population of folks better than veterans who fit the bill on those two things. 
Outstanding. Thank you. I think that is a great place to wrap up this full portion of our talk today. Thank you again, Director Jen Easterly, so much for your time. You were you were more generous to, uh, to us than we deserve. But thank you so very much. And we're going to we're going to let you go. You uh, we've indulged you've indulged us with a number of questions, maybe five or 10 more minutes than we were expecting. But thank you. And let everybody just fill the screen up with heart emojis and hand clap emojis. And let's let uh, Director Easterly know how much we really appreciate her. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you to the Cyber Warrior Foundation. And I know it's going to be an awesome panel. I see Tony out there uh, from Team CISA. So thanks for the opportunity. And I wish everybody an amazing Veterans Day weekend. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. That was awesome. That was awesome. So Director Easterly said some things that, that really reson resonated with me. And we're getting ready to Thank double click on a lot of that now as we invite the rest of the panelists into the conversation we have we have tony we have brandon and we have peter i'm going to allow them to introduce themselves to you in just a little bit but i want to double click on a couple of things that the rest director easterly shared because it, it was a, it became a a common theme that she kept coming back to which is intellectual curiosity if you are a veteran and you're entering this workforce, being intellectually curious is 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 critical, is foundational. Two years ago, during two and a half years ago during COVID, I used to host a podcast, and the title of my podcast was called From Curious to Learners, because I came up with this thought, and, and it, it really resonates and makes sense that the curious become the learners, and the learners become the leaders. As veterans, we we were we were voluntold that we had to be curious, right? We were voluntold that we had to be curious. And so now what I would like for, for these esteemed panelists to do is I'm going to, I want you to come up in, in this order and, get, and give an introduction to yourself. I want, I like Tony and then Brandon because he's, he's, he's the, 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 probably the baby of the bunch. And then, and then Peter, if you all would come and introduce yourself to the group, and then we're going to go knee deep and thigh high into this intellectual curiosity thing that we all veterans have. Tony. Thank you, Holly. Um, thank you, Director Easterly, for your remarks as well. Of course, happy ve happy Veterans Day. I know we're a day early, but we can celebrate ourselves at all times, right, for, for the hard work and for the commitment that we have dedicated to this country at some point. So um, thank you for your service. And, and I just want to say happy Veterans Day. Uh, Tony Benson, I currently work at CISA, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It is a mouthful, so therefore we just say CISA, um, as you heard remarks from our wonderful director. Um, I am a U.S. Air Force veteran, and I am super proud of that. You know, we get we get a run of some of the jokes, but that's okay. It's all with love because we all uh, work together to serve our country. Um my path, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, but my path uh, is one that I got out of the military. Uh, once I got out of the military, I spent some time out in the private sector, uh, worked at a couple of nonprofits. I did the I did the move to a couple of different government contractors, and then finally uh, found my way back into civilian federal government. So for me, it's been a, a great time at CISA. I've seen our organization grow, um, and Director East really shared uh, some remarks about we are hiring. So this is one of the places that if you are interested um, and you want to come and work in the federal civilian uh, network, definitely come to CISA or, or consider us. Uh, pass it over to Brandon. Thank you very much, Tony. Good afternoon to Cyber Warrior, uh, our special guest speaker and the rest of our amazing panel. Uh, my name is Brandon Beheimer. Um, I am also a veteran. I served in artillery in the Army, uh, active duty, through 2006, 2012. Primarily, I served as a lead vehicle gunner deployed overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan. I joined the military due to a sense of patriotic service and prior family service, uh, a huge motivating factor for me to feel like I'm doing something greater than just my own personal world. Uh, after leaving the military, um, my path was nonlinear. It was not traditional at all. It was all over the place. I don't have a degree either. Um, I actually started through audio and film, working on um, my most recent project, The Smokey Robinson. I'm happy to announce that I'm Grammy submitted, hopefully soon Grammy nominated. 
Uh, but that was with Smokey Robinson. And through that, I worked on film and TV and by chance just landed an IT role uh, as the lead role too. I had no clue what I was doing. Network admin just got thrown into it. Sorry. <clears throat> so from there, the excitement was crazy. It was unreal. No clue what I was doing. Nerves just jumped in head first. Got excited with everything and the relation from military to cybersecurity, the defense, the purpose. So with that, the biggest thing I've learned in, in my journey uh, to overcome is to stay motivated and consistent. And the biggest thing for that for me is to work in ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys, making sure that you are giving bursts of energy and commitment and motivation towards, towards certain topic, topics, and uh, but also allowing yourself that time to rest and reflect. I think both is very important. It's very easy to burn out. It's very high paced. But with that, um, I would say that my advice to other veterans looking to transition is to figure out what motivates you and where your passion lies within that field to help sustain that long-term interest and growth in this field. With that, I would like to thank you and pass this on to Peter now. Yes, thank you, Brandon. Uh, my name is Peter Campbell. I'm Senior Director of Cloud Security Engineering at Cigna. Uh, you know, what is the Cigna Group? Cigna Group is a Fortune 10 global health company committed to improving health and vitality. Um, you know, so how did I end up here? Well, I'm also a hiring manager as well, so I can share my perspectives on that for uh, any veterans that are transitioning. But uh, my military service, I was on board uh, the USS Will Rogers, uh, which is a, a nuclear submarine for uh, approximately six years as a sonar technician. And I had no idea that it would lead me to where I am today, but I'll tell you just briefly, uh, you know, what my job was, um, you know, as part of being on a, a submarine, I made uh, eight strategic deterrent patrols, right? So in total, I had to spend roughly 560 days of my life entirely underwater. So when we heard from uh, Director Easterly about being collaborative, uh, think about the need to partner with others, 150 of your closest friends, right, that you need to get along with for a number of days at a time, right, 70 days at a time, roughly. Uh, so that ability to partner and collaborate is really critical. Uh, but the other part, in case, you know, people aren't familiar with, you know, what, you know, more about what the role is, really the role of a sonar technician is, you know, sonar is the primary underwater sensor for navigation and to detect threats. So that was uh, interesting how that ties into what I do today because, uh, you know, the use of sonar, you know, sonar technicians must analyze data, collect data, classify data. You know, there's a lot of creativity around it. We're constantly looking for threats, much like we do today. So the threats that are out there are constantly evolving and changing. And it requires that, I think, the, uh, you know, intellectual curiosity, which I love that term, um, and then I think around, uh, you know, some of my own educational experience, I started my college education while I was at sea. And I'm sure many of you have probably um, have done the same, have maybe started it and made some progress on it. Uh, you know, when I uh, left the military, that's when I uh, and transitioned to civilian life. Um, I went on and finished my uh, degree at the University of Massachusetts. But I think it's, you know, it's really important to try to at least, you know, get a jump start on that with your career, uh, if possible. I, and I agree with Director Easterly. I don't feel that a college degree is absolutely required, uh, but it's a very competitive world out there. And anything that you can do to kind of give yourself uh, an advantage, uh, I think is a good thing to do if you can do it. You know, the only way I was able to do that is I had the right support network around me. So I was able um, you know, to get my degree as I transitioned to civilian life uh, through the support network I had, which was great. Yeah, but it's, you know, I really wanted to, like I said, thank everyone on this uh, this great panel and, uh, you know, happy uh, to turn it back over to Elliot. Thank you so much, Tony, uh, Peter, and Brandon. Um, I guess I need to tell you guys a little bit about who I am, right? I am Elliot Abraham. I am a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I am many things to many people. I am husband to my wife of 30 years. We just celebrated our 30 year anniversary a couple of weeks ago. I am father to my four children and several of them 
uh, already in this following me in this IT space. Um, I am a a leader in various capacities to to include my church. I'm also a pastor. I've, I've founded my own church uh, online ministry during COVID called Elevating Faith Ministries. You can look us up online. Um, and I am, as I stated, non traditional in my in the way I got into cybersecurity because. I am a, in my day job, I am a cloud security architect for Google. And I do not have a college degree. But what I do have in great abundance is that intellectual curiosity. What I have in great abundance is that ability, that aptitude that Jen spoke about and that ability to learn. I I can't even hear a word used in a sentence that I haven't heard before without looking up that word and finding a way to incorporate that word into my vocabulary. I I'm I'm self-taught. I received my very first certification in the in the Marine Corps by the NSA and the DOD as an information systems security officer. I've been certified countless times on all the different certifications that you can think of. Got my CISSP way back before they even had boot camps for that stuff. And in 2002, I, I got my CISSP, which still remains the gold standard in large part in, in, in the field of cybersecurity. I've, I've built high-performing teams of, of cybersecurity and risk management professionals. I've even started my own um, cybersecurity consulting company before. And um, I just love this stuff. Someone asked the question, why cyber? Why not cyber? <laughs> I love this stuff. I, I mean, I, I go way back to the days in the Marine Corps where we were working on Banyan Vines networks. And so all of that stuff was very exciting for me. And it got me started into this career where the hard work and the hurry up and wait that we did in the military, it became a feature, not a flaw when I when I got into the civilian works um, workforce. And so all of that stuff, that collaboration, working with with as part of a team that has helped me in my career. And now I'm able to help other people who are starting out in their career, mentoring a lot of people. And uh, and I'm excited to be here sharing with you all today. And one thing that we all have in common we veterans, as we start, as I start to ask some questions of the panel, while we were serving in these in, in our military, protecting our nation militarily, and now we're protecting our nation in cyber security. What, while we served, we all had a common language, a common vernacular, a common lexicon of which we all spoke and understood. What were some of the challenges for you? and translating that military lingo into civilian acceptance when you got out. There's a lot of veterans out there that are wanting to know, and some of them are probably struggling on their first job because they haven't made it, they ain't got it figured out yet. Pardon my grammatical regression, but they ain't figured it out yet. So, Tony, help us to understand, how did you figure it out? That's a, that's a great question, Elliot. Uh, it was interesting. <laughs> Uh, going from the military to uh, the private sector, one of the things that stood out for me and that I really cherished in the military was the camaraderie and how close you had to be. A lot of times, you know, your military family became your family because you weren't co-located with your family anymore, right? Um, and so for me, one of the things that was was different um, and that I had to adjust to was um it's a little different in the private sector, right? There's not always that level of camaraderie, especially if you're working for a larger organization. Sometimes some of that identity that you have, that you have that attachment with when you're in the military is a little trickier when you're out in the private sector. I think one of the other areas that were a bit challenging for me as well is there's a lack of structure. So you go from a very structured environment into an environment that can tend to be a little bit more I don't know if chaotic is the word I want to use, but chaotic. Um, it's just the the rigor is not necessarily there. And so that's one of those are probably two of the biggest things that I had as far as adjustments going from the military to uh, the private sector. Uh, but even the uh, federal civilian is very different from the military as well. So for me, it was really those two things that stood out. However, I think in adjusting to that, uh, I've become a more well-rounded person 
Uh, sometimes you can't go in, as they say, guns blazing. Sometimes you just have to take a different approach and it allows you to open yourself up to hear and uh, hear other things. I think I've grown and become, especially in my role as I've evolved from really going into leadership roles now, I've evolved and that required me to really learn some things about myself and really increase my emotional intelligence, right? So I think through that growth period, through those chaotic moments and through those moments where I had to kind of put my guns away per se and uh, and be more adaptive to listening and be more adaptive to the environment that I was in. I think one of the biggest things I would say is sometimes just go in, assess the environment first, kind of see what the environment looks like, and then move accordingly, right? Be strategic in how you move and how you communicate with others. Excellent. Excellent. And understand that the mission the, the mission is still the mission, but it's changed in how we apply it. So I love the way you put, I had to put my guns down. You can't go in all the time with guns blazing. Peter, how have how has that tra same transition um, been manifested in your move from the, the Navy, working on a submarine in close proximity with 150 others? How did, how was that going from, from the Navy where you're talking about scuttlebutt and bulkhead and rear and fore and aft and, and you, and you didn't put on tennis, you didn't put on sneakers or tennis shoes. You put on your go fasters. So, <laughs> so how did that, how did that, how did you make that transition? Yeah, I think a lot of what, uh, what Tony mentioned, right. Is really was very helpful. I think it's, it's, uh, you know, we're often trained as veterans to go and take that hill, right. Uh, same type of thing. You might come in a little bit hot, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, that that probably isn't really the best uh, way to approach things. So I think it's, you know, real, what I've learned over time um, is to really, you know, take the time to observe, you know, ask questions. Uh, and also when, you, uh, when you're when you leading teams as well, right, it's, uh, you know, teams will have or your team members may have a, a questioning attitude and that's OK. Right. So we're trained, you know, everyone on the all the veterans know this. We're trained really not to ask questions, but to really take orders. So that's really the biggest uh, mindset shift uh, that I see there. So, and I think it's, uh, and I think it's uh, probably for all of us, it's been a little bit of trial and error, right? So, you know, you're going to make mistakes, but I think, you know, the number one thing is to, you know, have belief in yourself, be confident, right? And, you know, and try to continuously, you know, move forward and observe what's happening around you. That's you know, having that and developing that self-awareness is extremely important and it takes time to do that. It really does. It really takes time. And, and, and poor Brandon, Brandon, um, I, I hate to disabuse you of the notion that the only real battle cry is Ura is not Hula. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> uh, that, that's a, that's an inside joke between army and Marines. We, that is going to, it's never going to end. It is Ura is not Hula, none of that stuff. <laughs> but, but Brandon, you, so, so you you may be a couple of years younger than us, but, but you still had to make a transition. It's, and, and for you, you really did what, what, what Stephen Covey talked about when he talks about in, in the book, seven habits of highly effective people, you really looked and made sure that your ladder was on the right building when you got out. What what led you from doing what you did, blowing up blowing up stuff, to now threat hunting? Yeah, thank you very much. I would say it, it's passion. It's uh, you know, I followed the things that I loved and and knew that I would commit to and be motivated to things that when I wake up I. I want to be you know they excite me there are things i want to go do things i do on my free time a time on my own so um it's definitely following my passions that's the biggest thing that's led me in life now it was uh, a little chaotic in a sense and i say one of the biggest things with getting out of service um is back to that chaos it is chaotic and there is no real clear mission uh, at any given time you kind of have a broad spectrum of a mission we're protecting right but it's not as specific in the small goals. So it's it's great to set that up yourself. Um, and, and I would say the biggest thing where disconnect comes is not feeling like you're a part of something. Uh, this lends to that to where now you feel part of something. But as Tony said, now you have a disconnect from your immediate team. And that's that's your family, your tribe, you know, your 
you're supposed to be counting on everybody around you and you feel alone and isolated and you go home to yourself. You know, you, you wake up and you eat your breakfast, your meals, or, you know, whether you're in a relationship or not, but as far as your team, you were used to waking up with a hundred plus people going, going to get food with a hundred plus people working out with a hundred plus people, you know, letting your butts off together. And uh, it's just that you lose the sense of that community and that, that, pride of a, a pact or a group that's willing to look after each other no matter what. So I think it's important to focus on that within a community as well. Find your groups, your niches, your passions, and, and hone in on those groups and talk with those people and, and try to share information. Uh, you know, I think that was one of the biggest things when I attended Cyber Warrior that helped me connect so much with the rest of the graduates and the rest of the students there is, is my commitment to myself and others of learning not only me learning myself, but helping others learn other, uh, learn as well. And as well as them teaching me, I, you know, I learned from everybody else and me talking and going through this stuff and learning myself. I feel like when we're saying that out loud, it just helps each other. You know, we're returning the favor to each other. I, I love that you brought that up because I was actually going to, going to, I'm going to mention that next, that one of the things that we have to do is we have to understand as veterans that we were trained a certain way. We were trained to take orders, but there comes a time which Stephen Covey writes about in in his book, again, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, is that we have to sharpen the saw. We have to acquire new skills. Sometimes we have to reinvent ourselves and we have to make sure, Peter and we we talked about this yesterday, we have to make sure that we are constantly evaluating what the, where the industry is going and making sure that we're keeping pace with our training. And so um, Brandon, Brandon mentioned that he attended the Cyber Warrior Academy um, cohort. And so, Brandon, how, how effective would you say that was in helping you to do just that, sharpen your saw? It was amazing. It was exactly what I need. Um, it was, you know, when I was looking, I was going through programs to try to figure out who really focused on the certificates I want, what the content was like, the culture of uh, the community that I saw from what I could see from the outside. And once I got inside and started talking to the people, realizing who they were and how they were and how they acted, you know, one of the first people I met was Jonathan. Uh, it was it was amazing discussion between us. And, you know, he really cared and dug into things. And, um, you know, the program, as far as like what it offers and what it did for me with the community, of like-minded individuals, a collection of other veterans as, as well as civilian too, but just to share this passion, to provide us a space to do this, to, uh, to collect these teachers that are caring, that are wanting to go through this and help us understand, not just give us the content, but help us understand it to make a difference. I, I really, really am grateful to Cyber Warrior for that. That is incredible. So this question, next question is for both Tony and Peter. Um, uh, there's an army ranger um, who he has a degree in IT and cybersecurity. He has about 15 years um, in computer. Ex- he has 15 years computer experience. He's tried networking as much as possible. What practical advice do both of you as leaders respectively and hiring managers in, in the case of Peter, what advice would you have, would you give to this individual um, outside of going back and joining the Marine Corps <laughs> and coming out. What well, seriously? What advice would you give give to this individual? I would say, uh, you know, kind of what Brandon was saying. Uh, I, I thought resonated. You know, really make it your mission, right? First of all, you know, make sure you're really passionate about it. So if you want to continue into the network field, there's a lot of uh, new uh, advancements around in in the networking fields, uh, software defined networking, etc. Cloud networking is its own specialty. You know, make it your mission. How do you do that? I mean. I can only relate it to my own situation. I, I spent about only my kids are the only ones that know this story. I spent about two and a half years, nights and weekends, you know, learning cloud, you know, just to become a cloud architect. And that's even before I got into cybersecurity. So having that kind of, you know, I developed a mission, you know, I had my own learning lab, you know, set up in my home office. And I, you know, I turned off the phone, turned off all devices, and I just focused. So if you can focus on that mission, there's there's nothing you can't achieve. Tony? Yeah, I think one of the things for me um, and that I, I advise people to do is also join some 
some clubs and some things in your local area. I know in the in the national capital region, we have a ton of just even meetups around cybersecurity where you can kind of go and meet and network with different people. Uh, but joining some of those groups, even even um, I, I can speak to some of the female ones just simply because they're at the top of my head. But uh, Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, WISIS, there's some other ones that you can join. Um, and it's a good network of people that provides training, but also provides uh, just people you can collaborate with and, and ask questions and, and things like that. So different forums like that are a good way to network as well. And then social media. Uh, social media is a good way for you to, I mean, plug into, of course, I would say CISA's page, but plug into some of those other cybersecurity communities. So when there's opportunities that come up, whether it be careers or uh, whether it be um, meetups or whether it be training, right? It gives you an opportunity to uh, broaden your network beyond just the people you know. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't have said it better myself. And, and I will add to that. Start now and figuring out what do I want to be known as? How do I want to be known? In other words, create your own brand. You have to, you can't wait for the organization that's on the front of your paycheck to become your brand. My brand is not Google. That's where I work. But my brand is not a guy who works at Google. My brand is that I am an expert at what I do. My brand is that I am an expert in public speaking. My brand is that I am an expert in mentoring and motivating other people. What is your brand? And to Peter's point, you have to, and Tony said it as well, you have to associate, it's, a, it's the birds of a, of a feather mentality. If you want to be known as a networking or a cybersecurity um, guru, hang around other cybersecurity gurus. Go where they are. Go where they are. If you want to catch a fish, guess what? You got a fish where they're biting. So you got to go where, where there's activity. You got to go to these meetups. You got to do these things. And you have to show yourself as someone who is informed, who's curious, who's interested, and someone who's willing to be able to help other people my when i got out of the marine corps in 1993 I, the the internet the internet wasn't even a real thing yet there were there were all these bulletin boards and stuff but i i built my first home lab in 1990 between 94 and 95 I set up a Windows for Work Groups network. I'm 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 dating myself here, but I don't mind. I I look good for 55. <laughs> and, and, but I but I set up my own computer network at home so that I could learn and try. And when I wanted to start learning of uh, security, I I learned how to. I would would build servers and write Perl scripts to harden my own servers. So when I got to the to to work. I had already tested it out at home and I knew when I got when I got to my to the workplace, I looked like a genius because you must invest in yourself. You must invest your own time and effort and, and be curious enough and humble enough. If you don't know, ask. I read everything I could. I can't tell you how many times I got in trouble with my wife when our kids were little. I was making seven dollars and fifty four cents an hour, but I went out and bought a forty five dollar um, networking book from Barnes and Nobles. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a miracle. It's the grace of God that I've been married 30 years because I almost didn't make it three <laughs> <laughs> when I was going out, buying these networking and these coding and these programming books, but I had to learn, I had to invest in myself. So veterans invest in you, believe in you and create your own brand. So here's a question specifically that's come in for Brandon. Brandon, what skills, tools, search do you think a threat hunter? It's a great question. What skills, tools, search do you think a threat hunter needs to be seen as an experienced threat hunter? Whew, that's a good question. Experienced threat hunter. Uh, I think as far as tools are concerned, the biggest tool is going to be your mind, obviously. And that's, uh, that's correlation. That's uh, understanding what's going on, trying to see the bigger picture, trying to understand what's the target network, what's the potential source, 
Uh, and when, when you're in that, figuring those things out, this is the tools that you really need for threat hunting, depending on where your focus is. But say it's network and or host space, you might be looking up a lot of file hashes, a lot of file names. You might be digging into binaries. You might be network information, packet sniffing, um, malware analysis. Uh, there's it's, it's endless. It's nonstop. Uh, but the general aspect of it, I guess, is um, finding the tools that provide the information you need within every specific scope. So whether it be uh, IP analysis, domain analysis, um, but figuring out what those are, holding on to those tools, building your toolbox, asking others what they're using, comparing the results, uh, and never settling with this is the answer because it never is. There's there's always something wrong with one that maybe something else provides something better. Just just keeping an open mind to all of the potentials and asking everybody else what they're using, getting advice. That's a great answer, Brandon. And and I, and before I ask the next question for Tony and and Peter. Um, I want to, just by way of information, um, I want to share that for those of you who are considering a career in cybersecurity, cybersecurity is not monolithic in that it's not just one dimensional or one thing that one can do in the in this vast field of of cybersecurity. As a, a, in in cybersecurity, you can either be what I call a defender, a defender are those people who run the firewalls and those defensive systems to keep the bad guys out, to keep the barbarians at the gate. You run systems, you lead teams designed to protect networks. And then there are also those offensive security professionals among, um, among which threat hunting falls within that category. Threat hunters, gray hats, uh, certified ethical hackers, those, those folks. So when you want, when you're interested in a career, in cybersecurity, you got to find that that niche that really more naturally fits what you're interested in. Because what you're what you're more most naturally interested in, what is going to get you up early and make you stay up late, that's what you're gonna you're gonna do best at. So you can either be a defender or a, a an offensive security professional. Tony, did I did, does that sound about right to you? I mean, I could be off base. Yeah, I think with anything, right, looking for something that you're passionate about is important. Because when you get up every morning, you want to have, you want to go in with the idea that you're doing something that you really truly want to do. You're impacting, you know, mission is important. So all of those things I think are key uh, when you're looking at what you want to do. I think what's so great about cybersecurity is it's so vast. There's so many different aspects that you can do, technical and non-technical. And so it keeps it keeps you and it allows you to keep evolving and really re reinventing yourself right into another portion of cybersecurity. I mean, uh, every day there's something different, right? That's happening. There's a new threat. There's a new opportunity. And so I think as long as you keep those foundational skills sharp and then be uh, ready to learn new skills as they, as they uh, come about. Uh, just making sure that you're keeping your 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 soul sharp, I believe is how you said it, Elliot. Um, and ensuring that you're keeping up, you're thirsty to learn, being a forever learner, um, and also really looking for the things that you're passionate in within this uh, career field because there's so many different opportunities out there. Excellent, excellent, Peter. Uh, yeah, I was just going to build on that too. Uh, you know, as I see it, I saw a question about how the uh, occupation is evolving as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really it's it's really limitless, right? So you know, back in the days, you know, the security teams would be, you know, within the SOC and they're not out collaborating across the organization. But that has completely changed, right? With with DevOps and CICD, you know, you have security uh, specialists are working directly with software engineers, right? To ensure that, you know, security is enabled across, uh, consistently across all the pipelines in the organization. Uh, there is risk and assurance functions that are, you know, absolutely criti critical for protecting the organization and they have their own, you know, career paths and specialties. So it's really, a, it's really unlimited and it's almost an endless path of opportunity uh, for people in this profession. So I, I strongly encourage, you know, people to, to enter the profession. So, so Peter, I, I want to stay right here with you because the, uh, the, there, there's a fact that you gave me yesterday um, that was stunning and that there's only 
six point four percent of our of of the U.S. population are veterans. So, with that small sample size, what do you think the impact is that veterans have had on the, on our in the cybersecurity field? Well, I mean, it's been immense. I mean, that number was eighteen percent back in nineteen eighty, and it's only decreasing now. Although the overall percentage of of women in cybersecurity is steadily increasing. Um, you know, but uh, and could you repeat the question again? Yeah. So, what is the impact? I mean, even though the, even though the sample size is small, what is the impact, and how can we improve yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think Director Easley talked really a lot about the impacts that you see. I think CISA probably has a larger percentage of veterans, but in general, you know, that the population is around six percent. That's probably what it is, uh, you know, across uh, Cigna, but. You know, but, uh, you know, based on, you know, some of the examples that we shared today around, you know, our natural inclination to protect, right, Uh, to protect the environment, to protect the cloud, to protect the organization, Um, you know, those are, you know, sort of innate skills and and capabilities that veterans have and that uh, need to collaborate also, as Director Eastley talked about, is so critically important. Uh, You know, these are the things, uh, these are the strengths, and we've talked uh, about strengths finding, right? And working towards your strengths, not your weaknesses, right? We talked about that too yesterday, I think, Elliot. Now I would encourage all veterans to like, like you're all special, right? You're you're 6.4% of the population. You have these strengths that can be applied in numerous ways across cybersecurity to help, you know, improve, you know, humanity overall, really. So. Yeah. Spot on. Spot on. Oftentimes we're told that we need to identify our weaknesses and shore those up and, you know, fix, fix those things. But, but studies have shown that the most capable and the most effective and the most successful people are the ones who know what their strengths are and they lean in further there. And so I would encourage everyone, if you haven't done it, if you haven't done so, you need to identify what your strengths are because we got so many of those instilled in us when we were in the military, whatever branch in which we served. There were a lot of str- strengths that were that we we received. One of I, there's a study called Clifton Strengths. Clifton Strengths and Gallup um the Gallup organization, you can you can purchase that assessment from there. But you do you do this assessment, they ask you 177 questions, 177 questions, and out of that it's going to give you the top 10 strengths that you have. And once you know what your strengths are based on the um um, um positive psychology um, field of study, once you know what those are, then you know where you need to go lean in more in everything that you do at your work every single day. When uh, And the reason I mentioned that is because when I was in the Marine Corps, I went to NCO school, and one of the things that they told us, taught us was in NCO school was public speaking. And after we had done all of the exercises, our final kind of um, exercise that we had to do was we would the the drill instructor or the or the instructors of nco school had a box and there were all these different items in the box and whatever they threw you out of the box you had to give a well thought out talk for five minutes out of whatever they threw you and so that taught me it gave me confidence it it gave me competence and knowing that I can do this thing, that is a strength of mine. And on my and guess what? On my Clifton strengths, communication is one of my strengths. That was instilled in me in the United States Marine Corps. So veterans, find out what your strengths are and lean in to those things. Don't throw them away. It is a feature, not a flaw. And um I want to I want to ask a couple more. We got time for a couple more questions and then we're going to we're going to wrap it up. So I want uh, I want to do it this way. So I want to I want to start with uh, Brandon, Brandon, Peter, and then wrap it up with Tony. I want you guys. You're talking to yourself. When you were. In in the military, what would you do? What would you advise yourself, your younger self, your still military serving self? to do more of knowing now that those strengths will benefit you in the future. What would you're talking to yourself? What are you, what are you telling your younger self, Brandon? Uh, Really? It's if, if I knew the path that I wanted to go down at that time and 
It wasn't kind of spotty. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So knowing what you want to do is a difference. And knowing, I think if you already know, the time should be invested in yourself. So focusing on the times setting up a home lab instead of going out on the weekend to you know, go do whatever with friends, waste time. It could be better spent investing in yourself and, and you're going to see that investment. Absolutely. So I say that's the biggest thing. Invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that, Brandon. I mean, I mean, same thing. Really take advantage of, of every moment and everything you can get, you know, through the military. Uh, there's so much to offer. You know, one of the things I did not do, I did not take advantage of uh, the tuition assistance through the GI through the GI Bill. Uh, the, during the time of uh, the period that I served, uh, I, I did not sign up. I wish I had done that and uh, and could have put that towards my, my college expenses and so on. But try to take leverage everything that you can, you know, while you're there and, you know, and, and use that to kind of uh, jumpstart your civilian career. Tony? Yeah, I think I have probably three things. I'll piggyback off of what Peter just said. You know, take advantage of the resources that are out there. There's a lot of resources out there that, I was so I was so ready to kind of just get out that I didn't even take advantage of. But there's a lot of resources out there. There's SkillBridge. There's there's all kinds of transitional resources out there for for you as you transition. Resume writing, things like that. So take advantage of those things. Um, two, I say make sure you build and maintain networks. So those same people you serve with could be the same people that you're working with out in the private sector at some point. So just make sure you're maintaining those relationships. Um, and do it organically, you know, but but just make sure you're maintaining those relationships, whether it be through LinkedIn or um, just shooting emails out to people every now and then. And then I think the last thing and, and the most important thing I would have told myself uh, way back when I was a butter bar uh, was that um, have confidence. I'm going to walk into many rooms where there's people that don't look like me, right? But have confidence and understand that um, I'm here because I'm worthy of being here. I've earned it. And then also be the representation that I want others to see. So I think that those probably are the three things for me that I would have told myself way back when. You just got it. You just gave me another thread to pull on as we wrap this up. Um, I, I cannot let this uh, let let us go and end this session without talking about how how debilitating imposter syndrome can be. And so what you just said really should resonate with a lot of people. Believe in who you are. Believe that you deserve to be there. So as we became, as we moved from military to whatever roles we're, we're currently serving in in our civilian jobs right now, how has that imposter syndrome, man, or did it? it you guys may, I may be the only one that had a little smattering of it just uh briefly but then i look myself in the, in the in the mirror and say you're a marine suck it up <laughs> but seriously how how has did that imposter syndrome ever impact you guys seriously sure i think for me i'll, I'll, I'll go first i think for me uh again when you don't see when you don't see the representation or you don't see people that look like you sometimes you just feel like it's not a space you belong in and i've rewired myself over time to really understand that I'm more than enough. Uh, when I came into the room, I had all the skills, I had all the knowledge that I needed and I'm continuously growing. So what I don't know, I learn. I'm capable of learning. I have the aptitude to do those things. And so I think I just constantly remind myself, I, you know, I think imposter syndrome can stay with you forever, right? But you combat that with positive reinforcement and affirmations telling you um, really that you're capable of doing. I've overcome these things. I definitely can overcome these things, right? So. I think just constantly reminding yourself and like like we said before, and I think it's been a theme here, be a continual learner, be willing to learn, be willing to uh, empower yourself with knowledge, right? Because at the end of the day, if you have the skills and the knowledge that something someone can't take away from you. So um, I think that that's a big thing for me. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Peter? Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Tony said, you know, have yeah, have confidence in what you've done. I mean, look at what all you know the veterans on this call have accomplished, uh, and the and the people in the audience as well. Use that to kind of you know bootstrap your career, and then you know that continuous learning that gives you a, a tremendous amount of confidence. If you're putting the time in, um, working at it, you know, you really don't have time to 
to have imposter syndrome in a way. So you can kind of work just through hard work. You can kind of just build that confidence and you'll, you know, and people recognize it. They'll see that you're competent and, and capable uh, at the task at hand. And, and last but not least, Brandon, I know you probably hear this, your imposter syndrome probably manifests this way. Brandon, you are simply too old for this job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, whether, whether it be age or anything else, I think uh, really that comes from within, just as Tony and Peter said, you know, it's, it's having that confidence. And I think the thing that helps build that confidence and reinforce that is through learning, this continual learning feeding yourself the information. So it's like imposter syndrome, something comes up and you're not sure and you're panicking and okay, am I right for this job? Do I know enough? Am I technical enough? Well, if you step back and, and you've done enough learning, you'll have a general sense of everything. And then when those moments come up, you can slow things down, dig into it and be like, all right, I know where to look. I know the tools to look for. I know the kind of things. So it gets you on the right page. Even if you don't know um, you know, the exact, the specifics of it, you know, where to look and find that information. And this reinforces your confidence, getting rid of your imposter syndrome. And like Peter said, you don't have time for it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to Tony, to Peter and to, to Brandon. Thank you to cyber warrior, um, Rainier, Rainier and John for setting this up and facilitating this, this powerful and important discussion. Veterans, you matter. We 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 mattered when we in the in terms in the case of the United States Marines when we stood on those yellow footprints at whatever Marine whatever recruit training depot we went to for basic training, and we matter even now as we're serving our nation and we're trying to get back into in the case of some for serving our nation in in this cyber in the field of cybersecurity. Three things I want to leave you with that I think is going to help each and every one of you to achieve your goals. We're going to rise and succeed in life based on three things. You're going to succeed in life based on your exposure, your experience, and your expectation. Your exposure is what's going to open your mind, and that's where mentors come in. That's where a mentoring organizations like Cyber Warrior come in, and that we can make sure that you get that you're aspirational and that you can see yourself. You can see that representation because that is the exposure that 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 awakens in you the dreamer, the visionary that says, "I can see myself doing that as well." Our challenge now as leaders is to reach back and expose other people to these things that's going to get them excited about cybersecurity. The second thing is experience. Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers writes that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. How much time are you devoting to your craft? How much time are you devoting to creating your brand? How much time are you devoting to networking? If you haven't spent 10,000 10, hours at a meetup, if you haven't spent 10,000 hours building and tearing down and building again your home lab, if you haven't spent 10,000 hours reading books that you can't afford when you're supposed to buy baby formula and milk, <laughs> then, then are you really serious about this? experience is what's going to give you that 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 aptitude and that confidence that I can do that thing and nothing combats imposter syndrome greater than the confidence in knowing that I can really really do this I'm 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 that I'm I'm him as as the young people would say I am him because I've done the work I've done the work I've done the time I put in the effort and then finally your ex that that exposure and that experience, there's nothing unless there's someone that is going to put an expectation on you that's going to demand excellence in everything you do. That's where leaders and sponsors and mentors come in. Someone has to put that expectation on you that you cannot. And, and oftentimes, if you're really motivated, you're going to put the expectation on yourself. I'm going to get this certification by next week. That means that the, if that's the expectation, I cannot go out with you tonight. I can't drink this six pack of beer. I cannot play um, PlayStation and Xbox because there's an expectation that I have to study and I have to learn. And I have to grow. Expectation is demanding and it's going to force every bit 
of talent and skill and gifting that you have in your body is going to force it out of you. So focus on what are you what are you being exposed to? Are you getting the relevant experience? And what is the expectation? I guarantee you, if you would focus on those three things. And if we as leaders would focus on making sure that those that we've been entrusted to lead, that we're cognizant of those three things, exposure, experience, and expectation, then the veterans that are coming out 200,000 every year that's entering the workforce, we can make sure that we continue to positively impact this great nation of ours, and we continue to support great organizations such as Cyber Warrior because they're giving you all of that. They're giving you the exposure, they're giving you the experience, and they certainly are providing an expectation. That's our time. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, veterans. Happy, happy Marine Corps birthday. Semper Fi and Oorah to all of the Marines out there, and happy Veterans Day to all of the veterans and for those of you who had questions about what do i do how do i get a job reach out to cyber warrior reach out to john to john and to and to um Rainier. they'll put you in touch with the folks at CISA and and even cigna peter is a hiring manager they'll put you in touch with folks because that's what they do and they do it very well thanks everybody thanks for joining us